This is part three of the air pollution chapter, chapter eight. The lecture topic is acid rain, or more properly called acid deposition. Acid rain refers to the deposition of acid, usually in the form of precipitation, either rain or snow. The main problem is with sulfur dioxide emissions from power plants and industries like smelting. The sulfur emissions from these plants mix with the rain downwind and it becomes a mild sulfuric acid. The main environmental damage is to freshwater aquatic systems, lakes, rivers, and wetlands. Fish, amphibians, and benthic invertebrates, we'll talk about what those are later, can't survive in acidic water. As I will discuss, acid rain has had a big impact on many lakes in Ontario, Quebec, and Eastern Canada. The section on acid rain is on pages 252 to 256 in the course textbook, which of course you should read. That's just five pages. So you'll find this presentation is a little more detailed than what's covered in uh, the textbook. This is a Steve Greenberg editorial cartoon from 1983. This is from uh, before much real action was taken on the problem of acid rain. Back in the 1980s, uh, many people, particularly in the United States, were skeptical about this environmental problem. Also, as you can imagine, there were strong vested interests, particularly in the coal industry. Coal generation was a huge source of sulfur dioxide emissions, the main problem and the main cause of acid rain. So an early response was denial of the problem, even though the scientific evidence was, was quite clear. And there was strong scientific evidence northern lakes were being decimated. This cartoon makes fun of the U.S. denial of the problem of acid rain with a word balloon coming out of Washington, D.C. Well, we suppose there could be just a teensy bit of substance to that acid rain hoopla. What is particularly interesting about this cartoon is its geographic accuracy, and you'll see that as we go through this topic in the slides. Cold-fired plants in the Midwestern and Eastern United States were one of the main causes of acid rain in Eastern Canada, Ontario, Quebec, and the Maritime Provinces. Another point this cartoon makes is that acid rain is a long-range pollution problem. The acid rain happens far away from the source. Uh, our emissions are carried by the prevailing winds, so sulfur emissions in the U.S cause damage in Canada. The fact that acid rain acts at a long distance makes it a much harder problem to deal with. For example, it's difficult to convince U.S. power plants to control sulfur dioxide emissions with expensive scrubbers when Canada will get most of the benefit. And as an aside, uh, you should remember that we talked about sulfur dioxide scrubbers in the air pollution control uh, part of the course. I think it was just the previous lecture, part, air pollution part two. But despite this problem, uh, as you'll see, uh, even though acid rain acts at a distance, uh, this problem has been largely solved over the past 30 years. So it's a, another good news story in environmental protection. I do worry that we will go backwards on this issue in the next few years uh, with President Trump being a strong promoter of coal-fired electricity generation. I'll talk about the politics of coal at the end of this presentation. This is an overview of the lecture. I'm going to talk about the nature and origins of acid rain, a little bit of the science. I'll talk about the effects on the environment, which is mainly on uh, freshwater aquatic environments. I'll give a brief history of the legislation and a bit of cooperation between Canada and the United States on this issue. And then I'll show you the progress that's been made in the deposition rates, the acid deposition rates in North America, which have been substantial. 
I should mention that acid rain is not just a North American problem. Europe has a similar problem. For example, in Western Europe, acid gas emissions from Germany and England are carried by prevailing winds and affect Sweden, Norway, and Finland in a similar way. So this is just not just a North American issue. Acidification results from the release of sulfur dioxide gas and nitrogen oxide gases into the atmosphere. SO2 emissions currently account for about 70% of acid rain. So sulfur dioxide emissions are the main contributor to acid rain, at least at the present time. As SO2 or sulfur dioxide emissions fall, uh, and I will show later in the presentation that they have been falling substantially, NOx nitrogen oxides might play a bigger role in acid rain. But for now, sulfur dioxide is the main cause of acid rain in North America. These gases undergo reactions to form various acids, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, and nitrous acid. Sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide gases can also go on to react in the atmosphere to form small particles. So SO2 and NOx can eventually form sulfate and nitric particles. These particles are solid particles. They're heavier than air, so they eventually drift down to the ground, causing acidification. So there is a wet element and a dry element to acidification. I'll talk more about the mechanisms of wet and dry deposition uh, in a coming slide. These chemical reactions show how sulfur dioxide gas is eventually converted to sulfuric acid H2SO4. I should mention this is a simplified description of how uh, sulfur dioxide gas becomes acid rain. Basically the rain becomes a dilute sulfuric acid. The main sources of acid gases, that is SO2 and nitrogen oxides, are from combustion. So we have coal, gas, and oil-fired power plants, smelters, I'll talk about smelters later on, and motor vehicles. Smelters uh, refine raw ore into base metals. The pie chart on the right shows US emissions of sulfur dioxide by sector. As you can see, electrical power generation is the largest contributor. Uh, for example, the US gets over 30% of its electricity from burning coal. And as we discussed earlier in the course, coal contains sulfur, which uh, when it's combusted is emitted as sulfur dioxide gas uh, from the stack of the power plant. You can see the other sources here too. Uh, transportation, Sulfur is removed from gasoline, so you don't have SO2 emissions from cars, but diesel fuel contains sulfur. So the emissions from this sector would be mainly from big diesel engines, things like trucks, ships, trains, and the like. Under fuel combustion here, this segment would include the burning of diesel oil in boilers in industry, uh, flaring of natural gas, at well heads would also be included in that, I would believe, because uh, um, the gas that's flared contains significant amounts of sulfur that ends up in the atmosphere. If you look at the uh, industrial sector here, a large portion of the industrial sources would be smelters. As I mentioned earlier, smelters refine ore into base metals, so things like steel, copper, lead, and all the metals we use to make our products. Uh, often the raw ore contains high levels of sulfur which get emitted into the atmosphere when the ore gets refined. So that's the pie chart for the United States. I also looked up the similar pie chart for Ontario. So here we have the one for Ontario. This is from the website of the Ontario Ministry of the Environment. The main categories are mostly the same, although they have slightly different labels because I got these from two different uh, sources. The big difference in emissions you'll notice is the power generation 
If you look at the power generation here, electric utilities, it's a much smaller slice than the United States. That's because electric power generation in Ontario is, is very clean. We get most of our electricity from sources that don't emit SO2. So things like nuclear, hydropower, natural gas. So the electro, electrical utilities are a smaller contributor to SO2 emissions uh, in Ontario than in the United States. As you can see, smelters and other industrial processes here make up the lion's share of SO2 emissions in Ontario. As I mentioned on the previous slide, the term acid rain is actually a bit of a misnomer. That's because acidification can happen without rain. I mentioned dry deposition on the previous slide. So the correct term is acid deposition or sometimes simply just acidification. That said, in this course, I will often use the term acid rain as a shorthand. Uh, in fact, I'll use the term acid rain and the term acid deposition interchangeably. So there are two types of acid deposition, wet deposition and dry deposition. Wet deposition involves snow and rain and sometimes fog. Wet deposition tends to occur far from the source. Dry deposition includes particles that reach the ground by gravity. For example, smoke particles emitted from a chimney are heavier than air and they eventually settle, carrying their acidity to the ground. There's also some acidification by what's called direct gas contact, so direct contact between the acid gases in the ground. The key point to remember is that acidification does not require precipitation. It doesn't require rain or snow. It can continue in a completely dry mode between weather events. In fact, dry deposition can be up to 50% of total acid deposition, particularly near an emission source. This diagram is taken from an environmental textbook by Masters and Ella. It shows the process of dry and wet deposition. Dry deposition tends to dominate near the emission source, say near a coal-fired power plant. That's shown by the big arrows. So over here, you can see the dry deposition. But far away from the coal-fired plant, you get more wet deposition than dry deposition. And that's shown over here. The upper part of the diagram also shows the formation of sulfate particles. These are fine solid particles that form from reactions in the atmosphere. The sketch shows that these acidic particles eventually get washed out by rain and snow here. And so they end up as wet deposition of acid. This brings me to another issue that I've already mentioned. Acid rain is what's called a long-range transboundary pollutant. Of course, air pollution doesn't respect political boundaries. Acid deposition occurs over long distances. The SO2 emissions from a cold fire plant typically causes acid rain hundreds of miles away. This figure shows uh, NOx, nitrogen oxide emissions, uh, from U.S. power plants and industry. The size of the purple circles here for example, indicate the amount of annual emissions. The arrows show the prevailing winds. You've probably noticed this on the weather uh, channel. In our part of the world, the weather systems generally move uh, from west to east, and often uh, the nature of the prevailing winds carries air pollutants from the United States up into Canada. As a result, U.S. emissions of nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxide are responsible for most of the wet deposition in Canada. Of course, the U.S. is not the only source. We do have homegrown acid rain, but the coal fire generation in the United States is a substantial cause of acid rain in central and eastern Canada. Okay, now we get into a little bit of the science. A key concept in acid rain is pH. The pH scale is used to measure the acidity or B 
basicity of a solution. It determines whether a solution is an acid or a base. You will have seen this general concept, I'm sure, in high school or perhaps even public school. As shown in the diagram, a pH of 7 here is neutral. pH less than 7 means that a solution is acidic and a pH greater than 7 over here means that a solution is basic. Vinegar, for example, way down here, is quite acidic with a pH of 3. In comparison, milk of magnesia, something you might pick up at the uh, drugstore if you had nuts up stomach, has a pH of about 10, so it's quite basic. So vinegar is acidic and milk of magnesia is said to be basic or alkaline. Alkaline is another word that means basic. Now here I get a bit technical so bear with me for a moment. This is for the students who've had at least some uh, chemistry background. When an acid goes into solution, in other words when it's mixed with water, the acid molecule breaks up and contributes hydrogen ions, this H plus here. For example, what I've shown here, uh, hydrochloric acid breaks up in water into ions and it is the hydrogen ion here uh, that makes the solution acidic. Oh, by the way, the AQ in brackets here stands for aqueous, meaning that the acid is in solution with water. This is the Arrhenius theory of acids, which you may have taken in chemistry. Acids are called proton donors. H plus is a proton. Here's the mathematical definition of pH. pH is minus the log to the base 10 of the H plus molarity, where molarity is the number of moles per liter. Now, I understand that some students in the class uh, don't have chemistry backgrounds and don't have strong math backgrounds. So if all of this is gobbledygook to you, don't worry about it. I don't expect you to know these technical details. So the key takeaway message for those of you who don't have a chemistry background is this. Even if you don't understand the chemistry and this equation, I want you to recognize that there's a solid mathematical definition for pH that is based in chemistry. This is not a vague concept. pH is a precise quantitative measure of acidity or alkalinity of a solution. It's something we can easily measure with high accuracy. Another key point to remember is that a change of 1 on the pH scale represents a factor of 10 change in acidity. So a liquid with a pH of 2, something like, vine or something like lemon juice, I mean, juice is just slightly above 2, uh, is about 10 times more acidic than vinegar, which has a pH of 3. So this is similar to the Richter scale for earthquakes. It's not a linear scale. Here's a few examples of pH for various liquids. The pH of pure distilled water is neutral, so it has a pH equal to 7. But a key point to note is that natural clean rainwater has a pH of 5.6. It's slightly acidic. This is because we have some uh, CO2 naturally in the atmosphere. CO2 goes into solution with the water and forms a weak carbonic acid. So rainwater is acidic in the same way that Coca-Cola is acidic. But Coke has much more dissolved CO2 than rainwater. So the pH of coke is about 2.5. It's a fairly strong carbonic acid. In comparison, natural healthy rainwater has a pH of 5.6. This is considered healthy unpolluted rain. So another key point to remember, precipitation is considered acidic only if the pH is less than 5.6. Keep that number in mind as we go through uh, the rest of this presentation. Oh, and that last point, uh, just to give you some idea about how bad acid rain has been in the past, 
in the 1980s, uh, when acid rain was at its worst, the rain in Toronto had a pH of about 4, sometimes even less. If you do the math, that's uh, about 40 times more acidic than natural clean rainwater. This is a plot of the annual average pH of wet deposition, so rain and snow, over North America for 1982, when acid rain was near its worst. Note that the pH of the rain is lowest, or most acidic, in the eastern United States, where population heavy industry and power generation is concentrated. So over here. Acid rain is not as big a concern in Western Canada or in the Western United States. As you may recall, this is what we saw in the Greenberg cartoon on the first slide. The contour values in this figure are average annual pH of the precipitation, so wet deposition. Wet deposition is particularly easy to measure. You just catch the rain or snow and measure the pH of the water. As you can see, the pH in southern Ontario, down here, is inside the contour of 4.2, so less than 4.2. I should point out that these contours are mean annual values, so the pH of an individual rain event uh, could be much lower than 4, such as when the prevailing winds were blowing in from the southern United States. This is a close-up of the problem area in eastern North America. This is the mean pH of precipitation between 1980 and 1984. This data is taken from Environment Canada. It shows more or less the same trends as the previous figure. Remember that natural clean rain has a pH of 5.6. So this, the natural clean rain here, is way below anything on this scale. So what you can see is how widespread the problem was. Even in the high north of Canada and far out on the east coast, rain was very acidic compared to natural clean rain. As I will discuss in the remainder of this lecture, this situation has improved greatly since the 1980s. In particular, sulfur dioxide emissions have been greatly curtailed both in the US and in Canada. Next, I'm going to talk about the environmental impacts of acid deposition. The main environmental impact of acid rain is on freshwater aquatic systems, so wildlife in lakes, ponds, rivers, marshes, and wetlands. This chart is taken from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. It shows the critical pH level of the water below which a species won't survive. You can see how the sensitivity to acidic, acidic waters varies by species. So frogs, fish, salamanders, benthic invertebrates like snails, clams, and crayfish all have different sensitivities. In this chart, you can see particularly that uh, snails and clams are particularly sensitive. They need a pH of at least 6 to survive. They build their shells out of calcium carbonate, and acidic waters dissolve their shells, and they can't survive below a pH of 6. With low pH, you also get reproductive failure in fish in acidified lakes. Fish eggs can't develop properly into fish fry, and since there are no successful young fish, acidified lakes tend to be characterized by an aging population of fish so only older or larger fish in the lake. Eventually, of course, over time, these fish die off, leading to extirpation. Extirpation is the local extinction of a species, so that, for example, you no longer have trout in a lake because the pH has fallen too low. Acidic lakes are characterized by clear water because there are no zooplankton in the water. You also have a mat of green algae and generally low biodiversity, so no fish, amphibians, and invertebrates. 
Of course, there are food chain effects, or what are also called food web effects. Uh, fish and amphibians are an important food source for other animals. For example, loons in northern Ontario feed on fish, so waterfowl will be adversely affected as well. If you wipe out a segment of the food chain, it will reverberate up that food chain all the way up to the apex predators. As a side note, some textbooks discuss the impact of acid rain on trees and agricultural crops. The scientific evidence shows that forests are generally less sensitive to acid deposition than aquatic life. There is also a confounding factor. The contributing stress of tropospheric ozone, so ground level ozone, uh, also stresses forests and crops. It's difficult to separate this stress uh, from that of acid rain. For this reason, the impact of acid rain on forests and, and, and agricultural crops is less clear. It's important to note that pH of precipitation is only one indicator of the potential damage of acid deposition. Local geology also has a strong effect on how much environmental damage is done by acid rain. Lakes with limestone bedrock, that is calcium carbonate, are almost immune to acidification. Sedimentary rocks buffer acids in the same way that adding baking soda to vinegar will neutralize the vinegar. Dolomite is another common mineral in bedrock that acts as a buffer. Dolomite is magnesium carbonate, where limestone is calcium carbonate. So lakes that have beds of limestone and dolomite, such as in southern Ontario, are essentially immune to acidification. In contrast, the Canadian Shield is mostly igneous and metamorphic rocks with low permeability. The Canadian Shield is largely granite, which does not neutralize acid. In other words, the surface rock in northern Ontario and Quebec do not buffer acid rain. This figure shows contours of wet deposition rates for sulfates back in 1984. The units are kilograms of sulfates per hectare per year. A hectare is an area 100 meters by 100 meters. The shaded areas in this figure show the regions that have the most sensitive geology. Unfortunately, as you can see, the high acid deposition rates on the eastern side of North America also correspond to the regions that have uh, sensitive geology. So over here we have uh, an unfortunate confluence. The thickness of the soil layer also has an influence on the amount of buffering. A thick soil layer is good for buffering rain before it flows into a lake. As the rain percolates through the soil, it encounters small particles of weathered rock, such as limestone, that neutralizes the acid in the rain before it reaches the lake. Unfortunately, at least from a perspective of acid rain, during the last period of glaciation, that is the last ice age, which ended about 12,000 years ago, uh, this ice age scraped off much of the soil from the Canadian Shield. This makes the Canadian Shield extra sensitive to acid rain. So the type of geology shown in the photograph at the bottom of the page is highly vulnerable to acid rain. The picture shows granite shield rock, with a soil layer ranging from very thin to non-existent. If you've ever traveled into the Canadian North, you'll recognize this as a very typical landscape. Beautiful, but highly sensitive to acid deposition. In this kind of landscape, acid drains directly into the lake from the local watershed with very little buffering by the soil. Based on surveying the local geology and soil conditions, it is possible to determine what is called the critical load for acid deposition for a region. The critical load is the maximum amount of acid deposition that an ecosystem can have without experiencing damage. For a lake ecosystem, 
this is the amount of deposition that will allow uh, the lakes in a region to maintain a pH greater than 6. I've repeated the chart here from a previous slide. Recall that above a pH of 6 you have a healthy lake with full biodiversity. Even snails and clams can survive as long as you maintain a pH of 6. This figure shows the critical loads that have been estimated by Environment Canada based on geology, soil type, and the sensitivity of the local species. You can see from the key that critical loads in Ontario range from less than 8 kilograms per hectare per year to greater than 20 kilograms per hectare per year. For example, in southern Ontario, it's not very sensitive at greater than 20 kilograms per hectare per year. Let me see if I can find that. It's uh, Southern Ontario is roughly in this region, right? This region is not very sensitive to acid deposition because of the sedimentary geology. This geology is highly buffering. But in contrast, in Northern Ontario, Southern Quebec, and parts of the Maritimes, we have high sensitivity to acid rain with critical loads less than 8 kilograms per hectare per year. So up in here. So in these regions, deposition rates need to be low in order to maintain healthy aquatic habitats. This concept of critical load is interesting from the legislative perspective. It gives a reasonable non-zero target for acid deposition rates that can be tolerated without uh, significant environmental damage. So keep this number of 8 kilograms per hectare per year in mind as we look at the historical deposition rates on the next few slides. Okay, this is a bit of a side issue. As I've discussed, limestone is a buffer that neutralizes acid rain. There have been attempts to reclaim lakes by adding powdered limestone, that is calcium carbonate. This is a neutralization process called liming. It can be done in various ways, such as by shoveling pulverized limestone from a boat or a barge. In cold climates, pulverized limestone can be placed on the ice in the winter by snowmobile, uh, with the limestone falling into the lake when the ice melts in the spring. It has even been done using aircraft which I would expect is an expensive method reserved for use on remote lakes that don't have uh, ready road access. This picture over here shows the liming of a Swedish lake by helicopter. Liming has been done experimentally in Ontario, uh, but not widely applied. As I mentioned, it's expensive, but in Europe, where they have a much stronger environmental ethos, liming has been uh, widely used. Thousands of lakes have been limed in Sweden and Norway. Perhaps the main reason for liming is to allow lakes to regain the ability to support fish. At a pH of about 6, fish stocks can be reintroduced. Of course, liming is not a perfect solution. It just is a short-term solution that treats the symptom. Unless acid deposition rates are reduced by lowering emissions from industry, liming will have to be an ongoing task. Also, when limestone powder is added, the lake's pH rises very rapidly. This has been shown to cause an initial decline in the lake's biodiversity and overall biomass. Some species in the lake which have become acid adapted are killed off uh, resulting in a new composition of species in the lake, and this new composition takes time to establish. For example, some species of zooplankton can become adapted to acid conditions, but are killed off by the sudden rise in pH. Zooplankton are the very small animals in the water column which are food for small fish, and zooplankton have been shown to be slow to recover after liming.
This is a brief overview of the history of legislation for acid rain, the negative impact of acid rain on the health of lakes in Canada was first identified in the 1960s, but it took until the 1980s for governments to take meaningful action. As I mentioned in the introduction, there was strong industrial opposition to uh, legislation, especially the coal industry in the United States. But in 1985, Canada launched the Eastern Canada Acid Rain Program with a target of limiting sulfur dioxide emissions to 20 kilograms per hectare per year. I'll show you some contour plots of SO2 emission rates and deposition rates uh, on the next slide. As I've mentioned previously, about 50% of acid deposition in Canada is transboundary. It flows in from the United States on prevailing winds, so ultimately the problem of acid rain could not be solved by Canada alone. Recognizing this fact, in 1981, the federal government signed the Canada-US Air Quality Agreement to reduce transboundary air pollution. This agreement is still in effect today. Of course, whether it will remain in effect under the Trump administration remains to be seen. Then in 1998, Canada introduced the Canada-wide acid rain strategy. The goal was to have sufficient emissions reductions to bring wet deposition rates in eastern Canada below the critical load. We talked about critical load in an earlier slide. Uh, in some areas of eastern Canada, the critical load is less than 8 kilograms per hectare per year. As you will see on subsequent slides, all of these efforts have been largely successful. This contour plot shows contours of average sulfate deposition rates from 1982 to 1986. In the early to mid 80s, the maximum loading in southern Ontario ranged from about 20 to 30 kilograms per hectare per year. You can see that down here. As we saw in the air pollution section of the course, Canada has greatly reduced its sulfur dioxide emissions in the past 30 years. This graph shows total Canadian sulfur dioxide emissions from 1980 to 2012. There was a 75% reduction in SO2 emissions over this period. This is from putting scrubbers on coal-fired plants as well as phasing out coal. Also controlling emissions from metal smelters is another factor. Reduction of sulfur content in diesel fuel it also contributed to emissions reductions in the transportation sector. So there have been reductions in SO2 emissions in many sectors. These reductions combined with the reductions in the United States have had a large impact on the acid deposition rates in Canada. This will be graphically illustrated in the next slide. This slide will show contour plots of sulfate deposition rates in North America over time. These contours are based on measurements of precipitation, so collecting rain and snow and measuring its sulfate content. Recall that the critical load for healthy lakes in some areas of eastern Canada is less than 8 kilograms per hectare per year, so this is the desired target to keep in mind. The contour plot shown on the screen right now shows sulfate deposition rates for 1990. So you notice up here for 1990. You can see that is slightly better than in the early and mid 1980s. The maximum deposition rates in the 1980s was about 30 kilograms per hectare per year, maybe a little bit more in some regions. We can see here that in 1990, the levels in eastern Canada ranged from about 12 to maybe 28 kilograms per hectare per year. Here's the same plot, but for the year 2000. Now we can see a significant improvement 
In 2000, the levels in eastern Canada ranged from about 8 to 24 kilograms per hectare per year. Now here's the deposition rates for 2012. By 2012, the deposition rates in eastern Canada ranged from almost zero, say 0 0.3, to about 12 kilograms per hectare per year. So these plots can be hard to read exactly, but regardless of the exact numbers, it's clear that there has been major progress in tackling acid rain. We're getting much closer to reaching that theoretical target of 8 kilograms per hectare per year, which would eventually allow the recovery of all the acidified lakes in eastern Canada. So acid rain is a good news story from an environmental perspective. In this presentation I've shown uh, the large reductions in sulfur dioxide emissions which are the main cause of acid rain. As you may recall from the air pollution chapter, there have also been large reductions in nitrogen oxide emissions since the 1980s. This is the other acid gas that causes acid rain. One of the graphs from the air pollution chapter is shown on the right. It covers the period from 2004 to 2013. Total reductions since the 1980s have been much greater than shown in this graph. However, in spite of these reductions, recovery of acidified lakes has been slow. Recently, Environment Canada did a follow-up study of 202 lakes in southeastern Ontario. Only about a third of the lakes had an increase in the pH level, or reduced acidity. They indicate in their report that uh, recovery is likely to take decades. The reason for the slow recovery is not fully understood. Environment Canada points to a few likely reasons for slow recovery. As I just showed, large emission reductions have been fairly recent and natural recovery processes are slow. They also point to the decline in the buffering capacity of soils. Decades of intense rain have leached uh, calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate from soils, and this will take time to recover. Another factor in the slow recovery is the sulfate buildup in wetlands and soils from all the years of heavy acid rain. Rain flushes these sulfates from the wetlands into lakes, delaying recovery. It will take time uh, to exhaust this supply of acidity. The Environment Canada report suggests that flow recovery of most lakes should occur within a few decades. Now that acid gas emissions have been brought under control, it is of course vital for recovery that SO2 and NOx emissions remain low and may perhaps go even lower. Among other things, it is important to phase out coal for electricity generation. The Canadian federal government recently committed to this by 2030. This course is a liberal studies course, so one of the key objectives is to cover the social implications of energy use. For this reason, I've included a couple of slides on coal, the economy, and politics. In the course so far, I've discussed many of the environmental impacts of coal. Coal is dirty. It's a major source of air pollution, premature deaths because of poor air quality, and coal mining also has a very poor safety record, with many miners dying in accidents and from black lung disease, even nowadays. Coal-fired power is also a major source of greenhouse gases, which is the cause of climate change. And as you've just heard in this lecture, it is a significant contributor to acid rain. But coal-fired power is also inexpensive, and cheap electricity powers the economy. It is often argued by the right wing that low-cost power from coal is necessary to attract and keep high-quality manufacturing jobs in North America. So coal is often a political football. Being against coal can be a dangerous stance for a politician, particularly in the United States, 
which has a large coal industry. In Ontario, the provincial government under Dalton McGuinty phased out coal uh, power generation in 2014. After the phase out, the Liberal government faced a lot of criticism for the rising cost of electrical power in the province. Over the past few years, the current government has lost some popularity due to the rising cost of electricity for residential consumers. And the Conservative Opposition Party has also voiced concerns about driving industry and jobs out of the province because of the high cost of power. So what is perhaps an environmentally obvious choice can be politically very tricky to implement. As I mentioned on the previous slide, in November 2016, Prime Minister Trudeau announced plans to phase out electricity generation from coal across Canada by 2030. This is something that the previous federal government under Stephen Harper did not attempt, in spite of our commitments under the Kyoto Protocol, which we did not meet. Trudeau's move is probably motivated mainly by the desire to meet Canada's commitments under the 2016 Paris Climate Agreement, but there are a multitude of other benefits that flow from getting rid of coal. Phasing out coal helps mitigate climate change, improves air quality, reduces occupational deaths of miners, and fights acid rain. Uh, so it's the obvious way to go from an environmental perspective, but it can be difficult because of the tension between environmental protection and economic growth. Recently, there's been pushback from the Premier of Saskatchewan uh, on Trudeau's proposal to phase out inexpensive coal. In the United States, Donald Trump won the recent election on a very pro-coal platform. Here you can see him holding a sign, Trump digs coal. This would probably be at a rally in somewhere like West Virginia. In contrast, Hillary Clinton had a strong anti-coal platform. As shown in this picture, she actually said publicly, we're going to put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of business. This statement was made during one of the pre-election town hall debates. She wanted to replace coal with greener energy sources like solar and wind. In some parts of the United States, there is no doubt that she paid a high political price for this position. To finish, I've got a couple of editorial cartoons that illustrate the tension between protecting the environment on the one hand and jobs and growing the economy on the other. Hillary Clinton wanted to move towards greener energy, and she was brutally blunt that this would kill jobs in the coal industry. In some parts of the United States, such as Kentucky and West Virginia, where coal mining remains a large source of employment, Clinton likely lost a lot of votes for her anti-coal platform. This cartoon makes fun of the fact that she was asking miners to vote against their own economic self-interest. Here's another editorial cartoon that makes an interesting point. Uh, you would probably expect Hillary Clinton to be uh, most women's candidate of choice for reasons of equity. Also in the run-up to the election, it was shown that Trump was not a strong supporter of women's rights. I'm being purposely restrained here, to put it mildly. This cartoon makes the point that, in spite of Trump's fairly obvious sexism, it is hard to convince a coal miner's family that they should vote to lose their main source of income. So the issue of coal for electrical power and the potential job losses in the coal industry was certainly one factor in Trump's victory in the recent U.S. election. And that completes this presentation.